Thanks for joining us here at Anathem. Just before we get started on today's message, I want to make sure you know how to get even more content and encouragement from the Anathem team. Anathem content is created to facilitate you becoming one of the most influential spiritual leaders in the world. So whether it's teaching and worship resources, leadership resources, or how to plug into a microchurch, or even connect through Anathem Biz Solutions, Anathem's YouChurch app has all of this great content and more. So download your free YouChurch app on either the Apple App Store, Google Play, Apple TV or Roku. Also, towards the end of this video, you'll be encouraged to give towards the global move of Anathem. Would you please pray and consider this? Because it's through the generous donations from people such as yourself who help keep all of this amazing content free for others. So get ready now to engage in this week's message as God takes you further and deeper into encounters with his always perfect love for greater impact because he wants to love the world through you. Hi everyone, welcome back to your Anathan Global Lead community for another week. As always, we're so honoured to get to spend this time with you, exploring God's word and his ways together. This session marks the beginning of a new series on worship called Why Worship? Over our coming times together, we will be exploring what worship is and why humans have an insatiable need to worship something. We'll also be looking at who we worship as followers of Jesus Christ, and why it matters so much that we do, how we worship and why there is so much debate over the correct format, and then we'll look at some commonly asked questions surrounding the topic of worship and why it's more important that we worship than how, where or when we worship. I'm hoping this opens up a lot of healthy discussion for you in your microchurches and that you will learn from each other as you wrestle with some of these ideas together. So let's dive right into this first session, what is worship? And why do humans have an insatiable need to worship something? For many of you, that statement is going to stir in you a response that goes something along the lines of, well, that's a bit of a generalization, isn't it? Not everyone worships something. Well, let's go right to a dictionary definition of the word worship and start from there. A simple online search gives this definition for the word worship. Reverent honour and homage or homage paid to God or a sacred personage or to any object regarded as sacred. A secondary definition says to feel an adoring reverence or regard for any person or thing. Those things that we honour, venerate, revere, glorify or idolise are often the recipients of our worship. Well, wait a minute, I hear you say. Doesn't that cheapen what worship is? We don't worship just anything. And I would agree with you, I'd say you're right. We don't worship just anything. We only worship those things that draw our heart's attention. In Exodus chapter 20 and verses 3 and 4, God tells the Israelites, Do not have any other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or in the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I am a jealous God. Basically, I believe that God is saying, I want your heart's attention. He wants to be the one that our hearts are drawn to in our need to worship something. Well, why would God say such a thing to the children of Israel? Let's remember for a moment who they were and where they had just come from. For 400 years, this fledgling nation had been slaves in Egypt. Living in that country, they would have been exposed to the myriad of gods that the Egyptians worshipped. Some of these might have seemed attractive to an Israelite slave, but God is introducing himself to a brand new nation as a God who is unlike any they have ever encountered before. The Egyptian gods were many, and it was common practice to give one's allegiance to more than just one of them. 
But here, God is saying very clearly, if you are going to follow me, then you follow only me. So why is that so important? Because he didn't want the loyalties of their hearts to be divided. And he hasn't changed all these thousands of years later. He still doesn't want the loyalties of my heart or yours to be divided. Because when the loyalties of our hearts are divided, we are unable to follow him with unity of purpose and intent. Many years later, when Jesus walked the earth, he said these words, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. You'll find this account in Mark chapter 3 verses 23 to 27, in Matthew chapter 12, 25 to 29, and in Luke chapter 11. It's widely accepted that this proverb means you can't stand firm if your interests are divided. So to apply that to this first commandment, don't divide your heart or your interests among many gods who can neither hear you nor care for you. Give your full allegiance to the God who brought you out of slavery and into freedom. But we still need to answer the question of why humans have a need to worship something. Where does the idea of worship even come from? To uncover that, we need to go right back to the very beginning. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we're told that God created humans, male and female, in his own image. We are made with free will, with emotions, with creativity, imagination, desires and needs and proclivities that mirror God's own. That means that, yes, God has free will. Yes, God has emotions. We know categorically that God is creative and imaginative. Just look at the world that he's made. But what of God's needs and desires? What of his proclivities, his natural or habitual inclinations or tendencies? What are the predispositions of God? From the scriptures, we know that God is three in one, or Trinitarian, if you prefer. You might have heard that term before. This just means that he is three persons wrapped up in one deity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The concept is familiar to anyone who's had anything to do with church, whether it be Catholic or Protestant, over their whole lifetime. We also know that God desires the love of his people. Not such a huge stretch since we've just looked at that verse in Exodus that says you shall have no other gods before me. But who does God worship? That's a question that fried my brain a lot as I thought about this. Many people smarter than myself have wrestled with the idea that God is in constant relationship with himself. That he invites us into a relationship between Father, Son and Holy Spirit and this belonging, this oneness, this unity that we are engulfed by as we learn to surrender ourselves to that relationship is the thing that makes us want to worship him. So my thought is this, Father God loves, reveres, venerates, glorifies, worships, the Son. The Son loves, reveres, glorifies the Father. The Holy Spirit loves, reveres, and glorifies the Father by leading us to the Son who glorifies the Father. There's a constant and continuous cycle of love and honor and glorification and reverence and veneration among the Godhead. And getting back to the beginning of this session, what was our definition of worship? Reverent honor and homage paid to God or a sacred personage, to feel an adoring reverence or regard for any person or thing. That sounds very much like what Father, Son and Holy Spirit spend an eternity doing for each other. If you would like to do any further study on that topic, read John chapter 17, where Jesus prays that we would be one just as he and the Father are one, and spend some time considering the implications of the role of the Holy Spirit 
as Jesus describes it to his disciples at that Last Supper. Out of all of God's creation, mankind is the only species that carries his image. We were made in the image of God to worship him in relationship with him. No other created being on this planet has that privilege or that ability. The beasts and animals of the earth and sea do not bear God's image and do not have the capacity to worship as we do. As image bearers of God, we alone carry a capacity for worship that must be directed somewhere. On that note, don't go away. I'll be back with some activation questions for you in just a few moments. Thank you so much for checking out our giving page. One of the very great honours we have as God's people is to give. Mm. Our God is a generous God, and if we are to bear his image upon the earth, it makes sense that we would be a generous people. Mm. God's people should be known for their generosity in giving. Yes, indeed. And at Anathan, our giving goes towards building people and not buildings. Every expense we incur goes towards reaching the people in your world, the ones you love and pray for mm. on a daily basis. So we have made giving easy. When you click on the giving link below, you'll be taken to our online giving portal. There'll be one for US taxpayers and a separate one for other nations. Then just follow the prompts to make your donation today. As always, our prayer for you is that you will grow further and deeper in your relationship with our always good God for greater impact on his kingdom. Remember, he, he wants, wants to, to love, love the world, world through, through you. you. Allow me to recap briefly what we've just discussed in this session. We defined worship as the reverent honor and homage paid to God, a feeling of adoring reverence or regard for a person or thing. We looked at God's commandment to the Israelites to have no other gods before him in order that the loyalties of their hearts would not be divided and so that they could stand strong in their worship of the God who delivered them from slavery. And then we explored why humans have a need to worship. My conclusion was that we have a need to worship something because we were made in the image of a God who worships and who invites us into that sacred relationship of worship. In the coming moments in your microchurches, I would invite you to discuss one or more of the following questions. Do you agree or disagree that humans are made to worship because we are made in the image of God? Can you explain why? What other things draw the attention of your heart? Are there things that you revere or regard as sacred that are perhaps in competition with your worship of God? In the definition we have discussed, worship is something we do, but it's also something we feel. Is this definition something you can relate to personally? In what ways? Could this definition of worship be changed in any way to help you better understand it? And what is your understanding of the definition of worship? Spend some time in prayer together with your microchurch. Encourage one another in your pursuit of the Lord. Provide prayer support for those who need it. Celebrate each other's victories and bear one another's burdens. And remind each other constantly that God wants to take you further and deeper into encounters with his always perfect love for greater impact because he wants to love the world through you. We pray this message today will take you to greater encounters with God's always perfect love. Also, I want to remind you to take a few moments to download your free YouChurch app on either Apple App Store, Google Play, Apple TV or Roku. For much more content and powerful tools to help you become one of the most influential spiritual leaders in the world. Also, if you'd like to donate to Anathan, our giving links are listed below to help us keep this great content free for others. Here are this week's activations. <laughs> 